Hey, Talk Universe, just a note about my interview with Bill Kiefer. It was amazing. Bill has some great value, and the audio was a little bit strange. So please don't let that bother you. Take some notes and enjoy this episode. Be the Talk, episode 303, featuring Bill Kiefer. Welcome to Be The Talk. We go behind the talk seven days a week for tips and techniques to help you change the world. I'm Nathan Eckel, and a talker myself, I'm interviewing others who change the world with their talk. You can too, even if you've never given a talk before. Let's get started with today's show. We are live with Bill Kiefer. Bill, are you ready to talk? I am ready to talk. Through Bill Kiefer's 30 years of leadership experience in the military, and large global corporations, Bill has been fascinated with the middle. That segment of organizations that gets work done has great potential and that is so often underappreciated. Bill Kiefer, welcome to the talk. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Your talk is called Investing in the Middle, and the middle is, we're not talking about the TV show, which I kind of enjoyed, but we're talking about the people who are the ones that get stuff done in organizations. They're underappreciated. They're overlooked. Um, you you mentioned uh, kind of the metaphor of flight and the drag and the thrust and the weight, and you have these these great tie-ins with position, promotion, and being paid attention to, which is really just a, a great navigational tool for any manager or leader or CEO or executive that is really doing their job, which is to keep the middle moving forward and engaged in the organization. Uh, Bill, please take us behind the talk. Oh, great. Well, thank you, Nathan. I appreciate the intro and, and the summary. Uh, you know, the, the middle is the bulk of the organizations in the world, public, private, for-profit, nonprofit, um, whatever organization is in whatever size, there are folks that are in the middle. And, you know, years ago, I was in a bookstore and this really got my attention. I stood in an aisle and I saw books, many books about the CEO, stories about CEOs, how to be a CEO, lessons learned from being the CEO. And I realized there aren't many CEOs in the world. And I looked to the other side of the aisle and I found many books about how to start in your career, technical kinds of things, brand new uh, topics and ideas. And it dawned on me as I stood in the middle of the aisle, there wasn't a single book I saw about the middle. And that group of folks that are in the middle, that 80%, they have so much untapped potential um, that I thought we, we've got a business case here and a people case to take a look and do something different and better. All right. So, Bill, the um, the middle, the people that are getting things done, the people that are the, the real heart and soul of the organization, they're ironically the most over, overlooked and underappreciated. Um, what are some things that you have found that, that the best-in-class organizations that you work with are doing to really – uh, keep moving forward and acknowledge that middle and appreciate that middle and get the, the best performance out of everyone? Yeah, you know, Nathan, that's a great question. And at the end of the day, as important as this topic is, none of this is rocket science. It all boils down to some pretty basic leadership ideas that we've all heard many times over and again. Uh, but it, it really takes the application of these ideas, simple things like understanding that a position of authority, a title, doesn't make you a leader. It doesn't mean people are going to respond well. And also understanding that folks in the middle, they pay attention to their surroundings, and they'll see what those folks in those positions of authority um, are doing, how they behave, how they speak. Are they paying attention? The second issue is really, to me, uh, about this issue of priority. Do organizations and people in those positions of authority know what the priorities are? Do they understand why they're important? And do they help everyone in the middle understand how they fit and connect the dots between their activities and the desired results? And thirdly, and arguably the simplest and maybe the hardest to do, is just paying attention. Do you understand how folks around you define success? Because we all define it differently. Do we understand what, ish, what um, items are impacting balance in people's lives? 
And are we creating, to use the aircraft analogy, are we creating lift and thrust, helping rise people up and get them towards some objective? Or are we creating weight and drag, holding them down and holding them back? And simply taking the time to think in those perspectives and take actions that align with those can advance the cause, overcome the unintended hurdles, and help people get to success. Well, Bill, I I just uh, can't agree more. I think, um, I mean, really what we're talking about is a term that that I hate because it's anything but soft. It's actually strong skills. (laughs) It's people skills. It's the the hardest skills at all. Maybe I just did it. Maybe I just answered the the question I was going to ask you. What can we call it? other than soft skills, maybe strong skills is a better word. What, what, what would you like to call it? <laughs> well, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about that soft skill thing a little bit. You know, yeah. I came out of the military, and highly effective uh, teams in the military are effective just for the same reasons that highly effective sports teams are any other team. It's because they address and handle the soft stuff. You know, if the soft stuff was easy, we'd have a different game. But the soft stuff is hard. So um, that's a great point you made, and you, and you hit that well. And, you know, it's human nature to avoid the hard stuff. You know, people have varying levels of comfort with, you know, human interaction um, and, and, and dealing with difficult people issues. So it's not surprising that we find ourselves where we find ourselves. But I think with a little thought and a little dedicated effort, a big deep breath, and some just good, honest um, hard work, we can make life so much better for individuals and for the organizations these folks work in. Yeah, I think, uh, Bill, being a complete civilian myself, and we just had uh, Veterans Day so uh, mm-hmm. this weekend, so thank you and, and so many of your colleagues for your service uh, you. and, and, and the dedication that you've had. I, I just kind of want to go into there for a minute because there's, there's this uh, view that many of us civilians have of the military where, where there's not much emotional intelligence and i think maybe it comes out of some view of boot camp where you're being screamed at by a sergeant you're basically learning how to respond appropriately to directions under life-threatening future conditions perhaps and i know that image kind of wrongly sticks in my mind and yet what you've just said and what we all know to be true is that to really advance anywhere especially in the military you really do need to have the that strength to be able to deal with with the human factor and have uh, the compassion and the, the the tenacity to really care for people. So I, I just love to hear from your thirty year career in the military, where you've seen examples of this this human strength of character, otherwise known as soft skills, <laughs> which I think I'm going to stop calling it that because it's strong skills. I, I'd love to hear examples of of how people have have risen, how how you've risen in your career, both as a civilian and also in the military. Well, Nathan, you bring up a great point, and um, the, the perception is is is, is erroneous. Uh, many folks see things at basic training. Basic training is a tough time. It's designed to break you down and re- reshape you to meet the culture that the military service needs. But one of the key points that many folks that are not familiar don't see is it's called the issue of commander's intent. It's not about fully, blindly, robotically following orders. It's about understanding the intent, the what is good supposed to look like at the end. Much like business, what's good look like? Is it margin growth? Is it market penetration? Is it new product development? If the folks on the team, the people in the middle, don't know what the overall intent is, perhaps the strategic objective, and they don't know how things fit together, it's really hard for them to put that effort in that gets the organization where it needs to get. So the big difference I've seen is this issue of commander's intent, which is simply what does good look like and how do I, as an individual, part of a team, help get the team to that state of good? How do I contribute to success? A big difference. And, you know, many of the military leaders I've worked with over the years, they are some of the most empathetic compassionate and people focused leaders in the world doesn't necessarily mean they're soft and easy, but they have a genuine level of compassion and empathy because they truly do understand the mission can't succeed 
without the dedicated efforts of the people. Well, I was uh, I had a recent guest uh, on on the talk, uh, Lita Citroen, and she does marketing and she mm-hmm. does uh, a lot of uh, working with military people who are in civilian life, trying to brand themselves, trying to adapt right. to the very confusing, highly nuanced and and highly dysfunctional <laughs> uh, culture of civilian life at times. And uh, and and it was just interesting because I, I remember from my conversation with her how kind of black and white and almost refreshingly it uh, black and white it can be in terms of you do have standards you do have rules uh you don't have a whole lot of room at least initially for debate or any back talk or anything like that um what what how what was your journey like into civilian life and dealing with just the highly nuanced the highly opinionated uh um, uh, sometimes arrogant, entitled uh, attitudes that I'm sure that you found maybe in the business community or or things like that. How how did you lead yourself to go from from that kind of a of a culture where everything is is pretty uh, apparent and do the things and you'll get the results to mm-hmm. you know anything goes in modern mm-hmm. uh, day America or or uh, capitalism. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's a great uh, a great question, a great conversation. In fact, I was just in Detroit uh, two nights ago with the Finance Executives International talking about this. Um, so, a, a great important topic. My journey, um, I transitioned out twenty one years ago um, after over a decade of service as an Army officer, and I'm pretty successful at that. I would like to say. Um, and what I found is I had absolutely no idea what I was facing. I knew I was going to go do great things. I had a great job. I thought. Um, and I was going to go just make it happen. Um, but I didn't understand what that whole career transition battlefield, if you will, looked like. I didn't understand uh, um, the cultural differences. Um, and that really caused me, as it does with many veterans, uh, a, a bit of uncertainty and, and, quite frankly, a bit of fear. You know, a lot of our over 200,000 veterans a year transition from the military mm-hmm. to the commercial world. And many of them come out not knowing what this commercial, civilian, corporate world looks like. So a lot of great folks out there. Linda Citron does a great job, as do many others, um, to help folks make that transition neat, clean, and well. You know, many of um, um, many of the issues that cause the challenges is a difference in a sense of purpose, mm. which is similar to the issue of priority that I presented in Investing in the Middle. Um, our veterans, regardless of service, are all about service and purpose. Many organizations have a purpose statement on the wall, but it may not be clear to everybody what that means and how it connects. And that, that was one of the biggest differences I found. So I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to fulfill a purpose. And I got to organizations and it wasn't necessarily clear what that purpose might be. Hmm. So that's uh, I, I can only imagine how difficult that is to be on purpose, on mission, um, achieving these objectives as part of the culture and have everybody around you on the same page and then be released into a civilian world mm-hmm. where you've got a kind of brand yourself. And what's your personal brand and what, what are you all about when when your mindset has been so focused on the collective instead of the individual? And you know, it's a powerful thing. It comes up thing. even in interviews. It comes yeah. up even in interviews. Many times veterans will interview and they will respond to a, so tell me about a time that you yeah. kind of a question and they respond with we. Yeah. Because there's such a sense of team and, and, and unified purpose and working together. And some hiring managers and some recruiters um, look at that and go, no, 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 no. It's not about we. It's about you. We're interviewing you. What did you do? That's a tough challenge for folks that have spent years all focused on we. Yeah, and and this is echoing my uh, my interview with uh, Lita, and we talked about that exact issue. And it's such a it's such a almost a shame because. Uh, people who are so uh, others serving to walk into an interview and just have that kind of almost like a Freudian slip or just a just just the normal way that they think and then having that double penalized against themselves when they have so much to give. They would be the most dedicated employees, the ones that can fulfill the mission, the ones that give real time, accurate 
um, feedback, all, all of those things being penalized for that. So uh, it's great to hear that again. It's it's sad, but it's 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 good to hear the echo of that whole piece. Um, you know, Bill, I'm I'm just wondering. Um, normally, I don't I don't touch too much on this stuff, but I think it's really relevant. And I don't know that you watch you know late night. Uh, comedy or anything like that, but we just had these elections. I think it's relevant because we had Saturday Night Live was in the news uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the younger, less mature members even of Saturday Night Live was um, was telling jokes off script about one uh, right before the election of uh, now representative-elect uh, Dan Crenshaw, who actually, that may have buoyed him over the top, but uh, basically uh, made fun of his war in- injury, his appearance, uh, all of that, just not not because it was personal necessarily, but because it was an easy target. And I think the way that uh, that uh, uh, representative elect Crenshaw really responded to that was a great model. I don't know that you've been following that uh, the last couple of weeks or not, but he basically played off the the insult part of that and said that, hey, I'm not offended by that. However, it might not be a good idea to my fellow veterans to to uh, make sport of the war in- injuries. But then he basically downplayed the whole thing. They brought him back on the show this past week. And uh, it was just a masterful way to to bring civilians uh, who are often like me too flippant and don't ha- have really any idea the the sacrifices and services that you've made with people who are transitioning back or even getting elective office. Is is this news to you, or were you kind of lightly following that whole incident? I, I've lightly followed it. I'm aware of what happened. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you know, I think, I think in the end, both of the visible participants in that discussion um, ended on a pretty good in a pretty good place. I yeah. thought um, it was an unfortunate circumstance um, that happened, um, but it was nice to see both parties involved, at least the visible parties involved, kind of step up and go, "Okay, let's take a deep breath here." And then in the end, quite frankly, move past the controversy. And if I recall correctly, there was even a little humor at the end. Oh, there was there was a lot of humor. (laughs) There was well because the 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 like the the pop star just broke up with the with the comedian and so that was part of the roast ah, that's that right. was part of the 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 cell phone rang and it, the the veteran had a, a representative uh, crenshaw had a ariana grande ringtone and and so when that <laughs> happened uh you know it, it got pretty good from there but uh, what a beautiful way of of teaching all the rest of us how to move together uh you know, super hyper polarized left and and right uh, in the United States, and uh, maybe a glimmer of hope for how we can walk together, uh, even after the results of this last election, which which are going to get guarantee all but guarantee gridlock <laughs> for the next couple well, of years. Yeah, and I think you know that that point uh, that points that circumstance points out the um, uh, the basics of making things work for folks in the middle. You know, at the end of the day, this is about people dealing with people effectively, empathetically, with some compassion, with some purpose. We have to get some things done. You know, being open to what other people, you know, their challenges, their opportunities, their issues, and figuring out how we can help each other and our organizations get to success. Well, we've been enjoying this talk with Bill Kiefer, and uh, we are going to uh, talk a little bit more about his talk, uh, Investing in the Middle, as well as the preparation and performance of that talk in just a moment in the Blitz Round. Hey, Talk Universe. I hope you've been enjoying today's episode with today's guest. But you know what? Many people want more than that. Many people that listen to Be the Talk actually want to give a talk. And if that's you, you're not alone. Listen to the rest of this podcast at the end I'll have a free resource for you just for listening. And we're back with Bill Kiefer. It is time for the Blitz Round. I'm going to ask Bill a series of either-or questions related to the preparation and performance of his recent talk. Bill, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. First question, were you invited to speak or did you apply? I was invited. All right. Uh, Are you a memorizer, improviser, or a blender? Yes. 
All three? <laughs> I do all three. He does all uh, three. What did you do for this one? Yeah, um, I actually did all three for this. I, I memorized the foundation, um, kind of the framework mm-hmm. of the conversation, understanding what I was trying to do and how I thought I wanted to get there, um, and worked hard at memorizing that framework. And then I allowed some uh, some room to just kind of trust my gut and, and do some uh, improv along the way. What's a uh, tip, tool, or technique that helped you? Rehearse. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Understand <laughs> what it is you're trying to do and practice it. And while you're practicing, you know, get some get some other views and opinions, but don't change what's core to what you're trying to do. Mm. Now, what was the most painful part of your talk that you had to cut out? You know, I was fortunate. I, I was able to boil down the key points and not cut too much stuff. Certainly, mm-hmm. there are stories and anecdotes of particular people and particular occasions. I wouldn't say it was painful, but I did have to to, to uh, walk some of those back and uh, and not cover them as deep as I would have liked. Well, good for you. Whenever I ask that question and get that kind of response, I know that somebody, the the the, the person that I'm interviewing, they, they they already went into it with the mindset of just minimalist and uh, and already paring things back. So that's uh, man, that's a that's a testimony to your your discipline and experience <laughs> oh, uh, on that uh, for sure. What was the last question? What was the most unexpected, strange, or just plain weird thing that happened before or during your talk? One of the other presenters on the day that I presented was actually, I found out that day, was the nephew of a guy I used to work with. Um, didn't know him, um, didn't know him until that day. And this young man has done a tremendous amount of work with like nature, filmography, and photography. Just mm. an award-winning uh, 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 photography and video uh, gentleman. And it was like, wow, I would have never expected that. Well, we've been enjoying this Blitz Round with Bill Kiefer. Uh, His talk is called Investing in the Middle. We have a link to that talk. You should watch it. It's at our show notes page at bethetalk.com. If you don't want to type that into YouTube, uh, you can also go to his website, kieferassociates.com. Kiefer is spelled K-I-E-F-F-E-R hyphen associates.com, kiefer hyphen associates. Dot com, And we'll be back in just a moment for the final word of advice with Bill Kiefer. Hey, Talk Universe, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you want to give the talk to change the world, but you don't know how or even where to start, no problem at all. Go to be the talk dot com forward slash get accepted for my new five day email course that will show you how absolutely free. Just go to be the talk.com forward slash get accepted. We're back. It's time for the final word of advice with Bill Kiefer. What is it? Um, three things. Be genuine, be original, and be brave. Bill Kiefer, thank you so much for coming on the talk today and sharing your wisdom with Talk Universe. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Nathan. You're doing great stuff. Thanks for listening to Be The Talk. For tips and resources to help you change the world, go to be the talk.com. See you tomorrow.